is Mamaw Yates, uh, otherwise known as Terrell Yates, and I'm here to finally give you your task for overview that so many of you have asked for. So this particular one that I'm talking about is the, t is the elementary combined literacy of math. Now, don't get confused. Not everybody has a task for. Uh, if you uh, have four tasks with 18 rubrics, then this is for you. For everybody else, you can just forget this because it's not part of your 15 rubric um, or your 13 rubric handbooks. This is for the 18 rubrics. So let's get started. So this is an overview and I, I get all of my information that we're discussing today um, from task four. Uh, your handbook goes through each of the tasks very, very carefully. Um, this particular one is uh, begins on page 45. And also, I am using the Making Good Choices addendum for elementary education. So everybody uses the same Making Good Choices except for SPED. Uh, special education has their own Making Good Choices because there are some real differences in their ed TPA from everyone else's. But what we're looking at today is an addition to the Making Good Choices um, that almost everybody follows, even, you know, everybody's got 13 and 15 rubrics. Uh, there's an addendum that is very useful to those of you who are doing the fourth task. And so uh, make sure you read that and keep it out because it's got a lot of your frequently asked questions. So specifically, you have done literacy, you've done task one, two, and three in literacy, and now you're looking at your fourth task, which is math. And what we're looking at here is, is it, you're kind of almost going through an abbreviated task one, two, and three, right? So we're going to be looking at a learning segment that you've taught or your mentor has taught. You're going to give those students a formative assessment. You're going to analyze for uh, evidence of um, patterns of learning, their mathematical understandings. Um, you're going to then find errors, uh, confusions, partial understandings. You know, where did they struggle? Then you'll re-engage the students, which is a fancy way of saying that you're going to have a remediation lesson. And then you're going to um, teach that and then give them um, evidence uh, of re-engagement and how well they've learned on a new uh, assessment. So this is it in a nutshell. You can see that first you'll be setting the context. You'll describe the class in a context for learning. You'll describe the learning segment that's been taught. Now let's be clear about this describing the learning segment. You will not submit the lengthy lesson plans that you did in task one. Uh, you'll see in a minute that this is just a brief overview of the learning segment. Then, um, then you're going to develop an assessment and evaluative criteria that will help you analyze the student's um, formative assessment. And you're going to try to find an area of struggle. You'll collect work samples from three students who represent that area of struggle, and um, those will become your three focus students. After that, you'll design and teach a re-engagement lesson. Again, just think remediation. That's what a lot of us call it. You'll collect the work and analyze it from that lesson. Um, so from those three focus students, you're going to collect three more work samples. And then you're going to evaluate the effectiveness of that re-engagement lesson. That's what task four is in a nutshell. So let's look at the evidence chart. The evidence chart is really your to-do list. It's the things that you've got to turn in for your um, ed TPA. So it's a very important part. It's in the back of your handbook. If you've not looked at it, it needs to be, you. if I, if I were doing the ed TPA, I'd print this thing off and have it laid out on my desk where I worked. So. Um, first of all, you're going to be completing a mathematics context for learning. There's a template provided, and it's just like the context for learning that you did for uh, task one before. 
and it looks like this and it's about uh, three pages this is just the template that's three pages long then you're going to be doing what they say is an elementary mathematics learning segment overview again there's a template provided and this is the template so you'll complete this you'll put in your central focus your standards objectives and so it's very brief because they only want it to be two pages max look at that right there no more than two pages so they mean brief um, next you're going to have a formative assessment that you're going to create that's this part c mathematics chosen formative assessment that's what you will um, name your file it'll be a blank copy like this one and then the last you're going to create some evaluation criteria so there's always a confusion between the term evaluation and assessment so an assessment is like a test or a quiz it is a thing that you give the students in order to evaluate their learning so assessment is more of a noun evaluate is more of a verb so you're going to evaluate their assessment. What is the criteria for that evaluation? And most people come up with a rubric and such as this. Now, um, a wonderful uh, woman named Nikki, who has a, a Facebook group called EdTPA All Day, has allowed me to use her materials in my presentation today. And so shout out to Nikki and the good work that she does uh, helping people understand the EdTPA. Um, we have next, you're going to collect uh, work samples, which will be from that assessment, right? So here's the assessment that Nikki made. And then here, she's going to have the work samples. So she's going to label those like you did for task three, focus student one, focus student two, focus student three, just like you did for task three. Next, after you've taught the students, you're going to have a re-engagement lesson and you'll have an example from student work. Notice that they have some specific ways that they want to make sure that you are uh, naming your file, that you use the term re-engagement. And again, you've got, so after you've taught the lesson, you're going to, you're going to give them another assessment, it needs to be a different assessment. And there it is, focus student one, two, and three. Then you'll write your commentary. And there's a template provided for your commentary. It's going to be about eight pages. I always get asked, is three pages enough? And the answer is no. <laughs> Why would you give somebody three pages when other people are going to be giving them eight? OK, task four. Here it is. And so it, this, she wrote several pages. I couldn't tell you exactly how many. This was her, uh, the first page of, of Nikki's assessment commentary. Now, um, so what do I need to do to do this? First of all, you're going to select a class. And if you teach more than one class, um, you, uh, you might want to select uh, just one class and then you want might want to maybe if you've got groups you can select a focus group um, maybe you've been in a different placement maybe you in your student teaching you're in one placement then you're another rest assured you do not have to use the exact same class that you used in task one two and three this is a frequently asked question um, you do need to have a minimum of four students if this is your whole class, this minimum of, whole, of four students, then you're going, to, um, you're going to complete the context for learning for just those four students. So this will be your context information, which will use the template uh, that's provided. And you will be no more than four pages, including the prompts when you, when you finish it. Now note here, again that mathematics task four can be completed in the same classroom as the literacy tasks or can be completed in a different classroom or field work setting that means you could really even do task four in a different school 
And that really helps a lot of people because they have maybe like eight weeks one place and eight weeks another place. So that really helps. Um, However, when you do uh, turn in your uh, EdTPA, you want to make sure that you turn in your EdTPA to Pearson tasks 1, 2, and 3, and 4 all at the same time for official scoring. This is what the context for learning looks like when it's blank. Um, now, you need to have a central focus, and your central focus um, needs to be uh, with mathematical understandings that include conceptual understanding, procedural fluency, mathematical reasoning, and problem solving. So that's often after you've been working through the um, literacy portion where you've talked so much about your essential literacy strategy and related skills. Um, the subject-specific emphasis of mathematics is conceptual understanding, procedural fluency, mathematical reasoning, and problem solving. And so a lot of people kind of struggle with what those terms mean. Okay. Let's go forward here. I lost my little thing. So when you choose a central focus, you need to describe a learning segment that's hard. This needs to be um, this needs to be material that the students have not mastered. That needs clearly because what you're going to want to end up with um, are some students who've struggled with it. And so, if this is a this is a review that you've done two or three times, that's not going to work for this. So it needs to be, um, you need to have a standard for it, you need to have objectives, but you need to make sure this is a learning segment on a specific mathematics topic that they've not yet mastered. Conceptual understanding. So mathematics is made up of concepts and it's made up of, of procedural fluency mathematical reasoning, and problem solving. And let me talk about the differences there. We're using an example of addition. If you're teaching addition, kindergarten, first grade, you're going to start with the concept. You're going to have two apples, two oranges, and you're going to teach the students the concept of putting this group or set, we used to call it a set, with this group, or set, putting them together, and how much is in that new set. That's the concept of addition. So they need to understand that concept in order for the mathematics to be useful to them, right? But they're not always going to have oranges and apples. They need to have numbers, and they need to have algorithms. The one plus one equals with multiplication, division. So there are methods to doing this. Once they've understood the concept, you now teach them how to be fluent, how to be fluent in the math. And that's by teaching a strategy or a procedure that they develop. So, okay, again, the concept is is the, the concept of addition. The procedure would be the, the numbers, two plus two. Knowing that when you see two, a picture of two apples and a picture of two oranges, that now you write a number two and a plus sign and another number two and an equal sign. There's your procedural fluency. Mathematical reasoning. One of the problems that we've had in math is that because of the use of the calculator, which is a wonderful thing, I'm not going to say calculators are bad, but what happens is that with an over-reliance on using a calculator, you don't recognize when you have a wrong answer. So let's say someone who never understood the concept of 2 plus 2 and couldn't visualize it. They put 2 plus 2 
in the calculator, or so they think. What they actually do is they press 2, 2, plus 2, and now they've got 24. So calculator comes up with the answer of 24. 2 plus 2 equals 24. If you understand the concept of, of, of uh, addition, and if you have some capacity to think logically, then you would recognize, oops, I made a mistake when I put that in the calculator. So the mathematical reasoning is important because it, it helps us to understand that our conclusions make sense. Problem solving. Problem solving is basically knowing when to apply the different concepts and procedures in order to uh, come up with the solutions. So Jane bought two apples and then she bought two oranges how much fruit does she have? Now we know that we apply the concept of addition. We use the procedure of 2 plus 2 equals, and then 4 is a reasonable answer. And that's what all that means. So it's not something that, that we talk a great deal a lot about when we're training elementary folks but it is what mathematics is about, those things. So what you're going to do is you're going to um, you're going to have your, I'm sorry, I got distracted. <laughs> you're going to have your um, um, mentor or you teach this learning segment. So you select the class. And then you're going to provide that. You're going to identify the learning segment. Now, this curriculum is based off of this learning segment overview. And it's three to five lessons. You've got that form to fill out. Um, so because this was designed for teacher candidates, um, this learning segment can be taught by either you or the cooperating teacher. This first part, the, the original, when they first learn this new concept. Um, then, after you give the formative assessment, it's you that needs to be, you do need to be involved in choosing and adapting um, the re-engagement lesson and the formative assessment for that. So, uh, but the important thing to remember here is that you may not have, um, have to teach the actual learning segment. So if you're basically usually in a literacy class and you're just coming into a math classroom uh, just for this part, it's okay to use your mentor's uh, learning segment. Now you can see here, here is Nikki's um, uh, learning segment overview and she's got central focus and her standards, her lesson one, her objectives, the strategy she plans to use, and what kind of formative assessment she's, she's using. It appears as though she has taught this because she uses I, but it's perfectly uh, fine, like I said, for your mentor to have taught this, so you might be, you know, just referring to my mentor. That would be perfectly fine. Okay, then um, you're going to develop your, let me pull this up here so you can see it better. You're going to develop your um, formative assessment that's going to allow you to see these three things, conceptual understanding, procedural fluency, mathematical reasoning, and problem solving. And these are important to, um, to making sure that you're able to speak clearly about all the parts of the math, the mathematical understandings. You're going to submit a blank copy of this formative assessment, um, including any directions or prompts that you gave the students. There. So this right here, this is the first, um, so you'll have like, this is part C, this is your artifact mathematics chosen formative assessment. So this is the first assessment that you're going to come up with. It's going to be one of your pieces of evidence for your art that's in your artifact uh, chart. 
And then with that, you're going to have evaluation criteria. So a lot of people want to say, well, isn't a key to the answers enough? Well, no, not really. Because um, how many times do you look at a mathematics answer that a student has worked out and you thought, well, they've got it partly right. And students will even ask themselves, do we get partial credit? And that's because they know that there's, even though there are right and wrong answers, maybe they've done part of it correctly and part of it incorrectly. So it is important that you create like a rubric that shows these, these different things of the mathematical understanding, the conceptual understanding, the procedural fluency, mathematical reasoning, problem solving. This is going to be your Part D, your evaluation criteria. Then uh, you will analyze the student work. Now, um, that's from this formative assessment. That's from the learning segment that either you or your mentor taught. So you're going to, um, you're going to take that and you're going to analyze it and you're going to look for how students did with conceptual understanding, how they did for procedural fluency, how they did with problem solving or mathematical reasoning. And then you're going to present that in a graphic. A chart, a graph of some sort that that shows their learning. Let me pull this down. Okay. Um, then you're going to select three work samples that demonstrate an area of struggle that you discovered. So you'll look at the errors that they've made, you'll look at their misconceptions, and you'll kind of, kind of okay, you're going to say, well, we had students that had this struggle. And then you're going to, um, when you have those three work samples, those are going to become your three focus students. Focus student A, B, C, or focus students one, two, three. Nobody really cares. So those are your student mathematics work samples, part E. Now, you're, once you have your work samples and you know what the area of struggle is, you're going to re-engage the students um, so that area of struggle now becomes a targeted learning goal. So say, for instance, the students didn't understand a specific um, part of the procedure, then the learning goal then would be based on that. So you have identify your learning goal based on this analysis, and then you're going to design the re-engagement lesson. Now, I know in task one, you had to submit tons of lesson plans, and it was hard for a lot of you all because that's the first thing you did. You don't submit any lesson plans for task four. You have, your, you have your learning segment that you describe in that chart, and then um, when you design the uh, re-engagement lesson, you're actually going to, to just write about it. You're going to teach that re-engagement lesson, and you can teach it to just those three focus students. Um, you can do it one-on-one, -on -one, small group, or you can teach it to the whole class. But you do want to make sure those three focus students get that instruction. You're going to uh, then collect new work samples from a new formative assessment. Um, you're going to submit those work samples uh, from this re-engagement lesson. Now, it's important that you not teach it the exact same way as you did it the first, your mentor did the first time. OK, uh, you need to teach it a different way and you need to have a different formative assessment. And um, then you're going to evaluate the effectiveness of that re-engagement. So part F is going to be your examples of student work from the re-engagement lesson. These three focus students work samples that come from the new formative assessment. Then you're going to evaluate the effectiveness of the and that's going to be uh, what you talk about in your mathematics assessment commentary. So um, when you're thinking about all of the important parts of this, um, when you begin this, you might think, okay, what kind of formative assessment should I choose? Um, well, you are going to be looking at whole class learning and you want to make sure that that assessment that you choose in the beginning 
after the learning segment, um, has an opportunity for them to show conceptual understanding, procedural fluency, mathematical reasoning, or problem solving. Basically, what we don't want is a worksheet of drill and kill because you won't see that. But if you're having the students draw out pictures or show their competition, or if you're having them uh, answer questions, problem solving, then you're going, to, you're going to get it. It needs to be challenging enough. You can't just have one that everybody just, you know, breezes through and makes 100, because if you do that, then you're not going to have an area of struggle for you to reteach. So um, remember that you are going to be selecting your three focus students in the beginning based on that area of need. So it's very important that you choose, uh, choose carefully for that. Um, and then your evaluation criteria needs to be based on mathematical understandings, the conceptual understanding, procedural fluency, all those things I've mentioned over and over again. So uh, once you've made this assessment based on those three, mathematical understandings, then your formative assessment um, needs to have evaluation criteria. Um, that evaluation criteria needs to go beyond just counting the number of correct responses. What does it really tell uh, a parent that, or um, for you that matter, to, to know that a student made an 80%? What does that mean, 80%? Well, it only tells you it's not 100%, right? But how does that give you any information about their learning and what you need to do next? So make sure that your evaluation criteria is based on, you know, what it needs to be based on. And um, so here is Nikki's formative assessment that she used. And here we see her uh, great rubric. And what I really like about this is that she's taking the time to talk about the procedural fluency, conceptual understanding, problem solving the objectives that are related to those, and what questions on her assessment meets criteria, progressing, wonderful. It looks like she's used iRubric as a, a way to help her create this. How detailed does your learning segment overview need to be? It needs to be brief. It needs to be um, just enough detail to show the score, um, you know, what you did, you're not going to be submitting lesson plans. So you just want to make sure that you have addressed all the sections in that template and that it's not um, any longer than two, two pages in length. They say here to keep your overview simple. I bet you won't disagree with that, will you? Okay. A little trouble advancing my page today on here for some reason. There we go. All right, so here again is Nikki's, and you can see that she has kept it very brief. Um, she's got her lesson one, the strategies they used, and then she describes the assessment. Then when you analyze whole class work, um, you're going to want to um, identify this specific mathematical focus area, this area of struggle. Uh, then you're going to be, to do that, you're going to be looking for consistency among the student responses. And so you can talk about what they all got right, what they all got wrong, but go beyond that. What kind of evidence do you have that they, that they learned and understood things? Not just their answer was right, so they must have understood. Uh, what other evidence that you have? So we start talking about quantitative evidence and qualitative evidence. Quantitative evidence can be shown in a chart. 99% of the students, 70% of the students, it's shown in a graph. That's your quantitative evidence. But qualitative evidence actually refers to examples that you can pull from their work sample. Um, so when you look here, you can see Many students showed that they could, blah, 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 blah. As we can see students one's work, this is an example of um, qualitative evidence. Okay. Then with the re-engagement, the question here is, um, what does it mean to re-engage students? Uh, well, 
it'd be nice if they didn't just change the lingo every three months. But uh, re-engage means remediate, reteach, all right? So um, let's just ignore the fact that they've tried to reinvent the uh, educational language that we've used for effectively for quite some time. And let's just re-engage means that we're going to reteach and we're going to remediate. Now, um, you want to make sure that you are using a different approach. I mentioned this earlier. And um, you're going to use the struggles that they had in planning. So if you see that they struggled on a specific thing, you can reflect on what might be a different way to teach it, to focus on it, to give them more practice. Again, you can do this in one-on-one, -on -one, small group, whole class, and you collect those work samples. How much detail when you discuss it? Well, there is an actual prompt that asks you specific questions. Um, it needs to have enough detail for the score to see that the lesson actually dealt with the struggle that was identified for the focus students work in the focus students work, um, that you did use a different approach than what was in the original lessons, and you need to have your learning objectives and goals standards, the strategies, learning tasks, engage the students, uh, the representations or the models, the materials that you use, and then the assessments. So it's all going to be right there pretty much in that question. And here is that question. It says, describe the, let me pull this up so you can see, describe the re-engagement lesson that you designed to develop each focus student's mathematical. And it tells you these things here, you need to talk about all of them. Your description should include. Personally, I think I would do a paragraph of each of these. And then, of course, um, if you're running out of, of, of space, you could combine those paragraphs into one large narrative. But um, this is what you want to make sure that you include. And then, um, you're going to collect individual student work again. And that's going to be like a new formative assessment from that re-engagement lesson. You're going to have these work samples. And it needs to show, you know, how well the students give, you know, provides new evidence on how well the students um, were, a, you know, how well they were able to um, improve on this area of struggle. And then you're going to evaluate the effectiveness. And that's the remainder of the commentary, actually. Um, you're going to be looking at whether or not there was a change in student learning. Did, did, there, did they improve? Um, and that will help you determine if the re-engagement lesson was successful or not. Uh, you're going to be using specific examples from their original work, as well as specific examples from the re-engagement work sample. And you're going to think about whether student learning um, was re related to an area of struggle um, that's, you know, or if it um, maybe stayed the same, maybe it partially improved, maybe it, you, the students ended up mastering the content. Uh, you just have to make those determinations as you look at the student's work. Key points to remember about task four. Um, first of all, you want to make sure that you uh, have a copy of the actual assessment from the original learning segment. This is going to be one of your pieces of evidence. You're going to make sure that you have a graphic table, a chart, or a narrative. Now, it always says chart or narrative, but I'm telling you, there's the chart is so much more impressive than just the narrative. So I really encourage you to do a, do a chart on the performance of the class um, on the original learning segment. You need three student work samples from the original learning segment and three student work samples from the same students for the engagement lesson. You need specific evidence uh, of student work to support your evaluation. Now, what to avoid? Well, content inaccuracies, um, which admittedly, I think that's a little hard to do at the elementary level, but you know, nothing's 
it's obviously there's a reason they they bring it up um, so you want to have a targeted learning objective um, that's not you want to make sure you don't have a targeted learning objective that's not aligned um, with the identified area of struggle so you want to make sure that you what you target and you know with the struggle um, that they are aligned you want to make sure that um, when you talk about the students learning that it can be seen in the work samples and uh, you want to make sure that when you in your re-engagement lesson where you're reteaching you want to make sure um, that they, you're not reteaching using the exact same methods and strategies. And that might be why they avoid the term reteaching, I'm not sure. Um, but it basically, uh, the re-engagement lesson is a reteaching lesson where you use a different strategy. Okay, so. Then this is all going to be assessed. Um, you'll write your commentary, and then you've got rubric 16, uh, where you're going to uh, show how well you analyze the whole classes, um, the whole class evidence, how well you identified uh, patterns of student learning on the original work. And then um, in rubric 17, uh, you want to you know, this is how well you're using evidence from the focus students work samples to identify the student struggles. Um, this is where um, you want to make sure that you're explaining based on those uh, mathematical understandings that we talked about. And then rubric 18, um, talking about um, how, how well you can reflect on your teaching. In uh, future, uh, excuse me, future videos that I have coming up, we will look at each of the prompts of Task 4 one at a time, and I'll give you some suggestions for that. I don't have those made yet <laughs> as of today, but maybe if you're watching this a, a, a couple of months from now, you will see that I do have... Um, prompts um, discussed for each of those in task four. I hope you have a great day and again thank you Nikki for allowing me to use your materials. Check out her Facebook group EdTPA, EdTPA All Day.